Welcome to Beyond the Diploma, where we discuss navigating the university experience in Canada and share insight and tools for success. I'm Octavian Turner, and I'm an undergraduate chemistry student at the University of British Columbia and a clinical research assistant in the Division of General Surgery at Vancouver General Hospital. Today, my guest is Thomas Iverson. Thomas is a senior kinesiology student with specialization in multidisciplinary sciences at the University of British Columbia. He is also a research assistant in the Department of Family Practice in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. He develops community asset maps for social prescription, does data collection, and is the first author of the paper Effective Volunteers in Interventions for Middle-Aged and Older Adults Living with Non-Communicable Diseases, a Protocol for a Rapid Systematic Review. He was also a research assistant in UBC's Perceptual Motor Dynamics Lab, where he was responsible for subject recruitment and neuromechanical data collection. Thomas is a recipient of the UBC Kinesiology Alumni Scholarship, which is awarded to undergraduate students in kinesiology who have displayed exceptional academic achievement, leadership, and competency in their field of specialization. Thomas is a provincial gold medalist in sprinting for the 100, 200, and 400 meter sprints, and is also a singer, songwriter, producer, and multi-instrumentalist. Today's discussion covers his experience in the kinesiology program at UBC, why he chose his specialization, how he became a volunteer research assistant in Dr. Romeo Chua's Perceptual Motor Dynamics Lab, his work-learn experience, how he obtained first authorship on a paper to be published, and lastly, his advice for incoming and current kinesiology students. Thomas Iverson, welcome. Thank you for having me. So, there are five sections to our interview today, and they're as follows. Kinesiology at UBC, research experience, first authorship, and advice for incoming and current kinesiology students. According to Quacarelli Simmons in 2022, the world's largest global higher education analyzing network, UBC School of Kinesiology, together with UBC O School of Health and Exercise Sciences, ranked number one in Canada and North America, and third in the world in sports-related subjects. I'd like to start off by asking where you apply to, the programs you apply to, and why you chose UBC. Well, you know what? My university application experience was a little bit unique, uh, to say the least, because I actually only applied to two schools. Uh, so I applied to the University of British Columbia, UBC, uh, and I applied to McGill in Montreal. Uh, and so the reason I only applied to two schools is because I applied fairly early on in the, in the process. So I applied to UBC for their early applications deadline, which is uh, at the start of December. Mm -hmm. um, and then I applied to McGill in about February. And... Uh, basically, my strategy was just applying early, and then if I got in early admissions, then I wouldn't have to deal with the application process to other places, because those are my top two choices. Um, and so I applied to UBC. The, the UBC admissions process is, is relatively rigorous. It's, it's not super, super, uh, super extreme, but uh, relative to the McGill application process, McGill, you basically just send in your transcript, and that's it. They There's just no essay. No essay, nothing. Wow. Um, but UBC, yeah, you have to write like a, a kind of 500-word personal statement, and then you have to answer a couple of questions, maybe sort of 250-word answer, um, and then another 250-word answer. So there, there is a little bit of writing involved with the UBC application, but mm -hmm. uh, it definitely gives a much more sort of personal edge to the, to the application process. Yeah. Um, but once I was accepted into UBC kinesiology in the early admissions process, I, that was pretty much it. That's what I was going to accept. That's where I was going. Did you also apply to kinesiology at McGill? Uh, so McGill doesn't actually have a kinesiology program, so I applied, okay. I believe, just to general sciences. And I also got into general sciences at McGill. I see. I remember when I applied to UBC, that some of the questions, the essay questions were like, you know, what's important to you? You know, tell us about some extracurriculars. Were questions similar like that when you applied? Yeah, it was more or less, um, I think that there was one question that was writing about like a significant sort of just sort of personal experiences and um, writing about kind of a, a, a single experience that you think sort of best resents your personal development. What you um, learned and exactly that sort of along those lines. Uh, so I actually wrote about because uh, I played football in high school and I think that I went through a pretty significant sort of personal development journey through football because I started off as just um, just kind of trying it out yeah uh, and then I ended up being uh, a team captain for the last two years and, and a leader on the team uh, so that was a really significant sort of journey for me and that kind of allowed me to 
kind of opened doors to other leadership opportunities mm-hmm. um, and and other things. I ended up coaching the football team in grade 12, the, the spring training camp. Um, so that's just that was just something I was able to write about, and it was just a very a, a significant journey. That, yeah, kind of helped me help me sort of uh, describe my path. Well, I know it sometimes it's difficult to sort of figure out which things to talk about, which experiences, because there's so many, and you're like, you know, this one's good, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to narrow it down to what's important to you and how you develop the most with it. Exactly. And I don't think that they're necessarily going to judge you based on what you pick, but I think it is best when you're, when you're talking about your sort of personal experiences to be specific and talk about yeah. specific things that have happened to you. Because yeah. the worst thing that you can do is just be vague and talk about general experiences and sort of general things like that, because that's what everybody is writing about. The only way that you're going to sort of catch their attention is to be specific and write about something that is very, very personal to you. Mm-hmm. And... It is, in my opinion, better to just pick a single topic like that and just write about that because I think you're able to get a lot more sort of nuance in your answers, which is, I think, what they're looking for. I agree. Tell me a little bit about the program at UBC that you're in. There's about 300 students every year? Yeah, yeah, about about 300 students, maybe a little less per year. Um, kinesiology is... Uh, a very multidisciplinary program. Yeah. So it's sort of a mix of the kind of natural sciences that you would get in like UBC science, mm-hmm. um, a mix of some sort of social sciences, psychology. Um, there's all sorts of things, uh, and it kind of touches on on a, on a broad range of topics. Kinesiology, at its core, uh, kind of like how you how you define it, it is that is it's the study of human movement. Um, so it is. I mean, that's really broad, if you think about it. Like, yeah. just human movement, what does that even mean? Uh, and it means different things, depending on who you're talking to. So if you're talking to a psychologist, like a sports psychologist, it could be, you know, maybe what motivates people to move. If you're talking to a social scientist in kinesiology, it could be sort of what barriers maybe restrict people and, and hold people back from moving, certain people groups. If you're talking to a physiologist, it could be the physiology of movement. How do we generate the, the ATP that moves our muscles? Mm-hmm. If you're talking to an anatomist, it could be, well, if you flex your arm, what muscles are activated during that movement. So there there are all sorts of different branches of kinesiology, and the undergraduate experience really kind of touches on all of those branches. Um, So it is quite broad, and because of that, uh, it is kind of hard in kinesiology to get into a lot of depth in one specific subject. Uh, So it's not great if you already have an exact idea of what you want to go into, but if you don't have an exact idea of what you want to go into and you do want to kind of get a taste of everything and sort of figure that out, then it's a really good path. And provides those foundations for you to Exactly. Explore. It provides foundations to jump off in a lot of different directions. Yeah. I'm curious about your program because it's a little smaller than, of course, the Faculty of Science, like biology, you know. <laughs> um, are there some GPA requirements that you need to maintain to stay in the program? Um, as far as I'm aware, you just need to pass your courses. Right. Um, there are required. So in first year, there are six required kinesiology courses and then one required writing course. Uh, and you need to basically pass those in order to get second year standing. And then in second year, there are seven required courses that you need to pass in order to get third year standing. Uh, but once you are in third and fourth year, you're basically just picking courses from a sort of list and, and you get to pick basically the courses that you want to take. There are some sort of minor restrictions depending on the stream that you go into, uh, but otherwise it's a relatively free selection. Is it quite common to take a full course load in KIN, like five courses? Or? It is It is fairly common, uh, yeah. especially first and second year, just to make sure that you get those requirements, right. um, because six plus one in first year makes seven courses, which, if I mean, you, the thing is, you can only take those courses and and get into second year. I, I do think that you need to have 24 credits, actually, uh, to get second That's year right. standing, That's uh, right. which would be four courses and four courses if you split it evenly between two semesters. Um, of course, you don't have to do that. There, there is more freedom in terms of how you do that, but that's fairly standard, is taking four courses in first semester, four courses in second semester. Um, but I know people who are doing all sorts of things. I know people who are taking one or two courses and working. I know people who are taking six courses. It all just kind of depends on circumstance. Right. 
in your first and second year, are there some courses you could take in the summer, too, if you missed? Um, there's a very limited selection of, okay. of kin- kinesiology-specific courses that you can take in the summer. Okay. Uh, the thing with kin is that, uh, like all of the courses that you're taking, the required courses are unique to the, the, the school of kinesiology. Right. It's not like they're science courses that are sort of curated for kinesiology students. It is actually, like, the course code is kin. I see. Um, and there's only a fairly limited number. I think you might be able to take some of the, the major courses, like anatomy, in the summer. Um, but you need to be careful about that in terms, of, in terms of planning your degree, about which courses you sort of pick and choose during the semester. So even if you don't know exactly what you might want to pursue as a stream, it's still good to sort of maybe plan out at least your first year in your summer and how you might want to... For sure, exactly. Those courses. Yeah. Can you describe what the culture's like in kinesiology? Kinesiology, I would say, is a very unique culture. I think it's very laid back compared to a lot okay. of other faculties. Um, and there are a lot of athletes in kinesiology. Um, so Varsity are, specific? Uh, both varsity and just generally. But, I mean, compared to, I would say, basically all other other schools or faculties at UBC, it is probably like the highest number of varsity athletes per capita, which I guess is kind of what you expect. It's yeah. kinesiology is relatively synonymous with sports science. Um, not entirely. They do they do kind of differ in a way, but uh, there are a lot of athletes. Um, I mean, I personally am an athlete. I'm not a varsity athlete, um, but I do kind of play rec sports and that sort of thing. Um, but the other piece of it is that there are also non-athletes. So you're not going to be you know, left out if you don't play any sports. Right. Um, I have a bunch of friends who, who don't play any sports at all. I have a bunch of friends who are varsity athletes. I have a bunch of friends who just play recreationally. So there is still a broad spectrum of, of people in terms of like athleticism and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think that anybody should feel like they're going to be left out, I guess, if they don't play sports. Well, that's good to hear. What are some of the career interests of you know some of your peers and... So the main two, I would say, and these are kind of the most prestigious uh, that people in in, in kinesiology are interested in, are uh, physiotherapy. So physiotherapy, I would say, is kind of number one. That is, if you talk to a lot of people in kin, uh, a lot of people are basically planning to go into physio. Uh, That's why they became interested in kinesiology in the first place. Um, I personally was first interested in going into physio when I joined kin. I have since sort of shifted away from that, but okay. that is what got me interested in it, and that's that's the same that that, that goes for a lot of people who are in kin. Um, and then the second major one is med school. Um, so a lot of people, I think, kind of use kin as like <laughs> almost like an easy way into med school because you can kind of go through it and you don't have to take all of the hard science courses. Yeah. Um, personally, I don't think that's the best way of doing it because yeah. the thing is, if you want to do it that way, then you also probably are going to end up taking really difficult electives mm-hmm. um, because you're probably still going to want to take all those chemistry and biochemistry and organic chemistry and all those courses anyways. For the MCAT. Exactly, uh, exactly. Studying for the MCAT is still a really big deal, regardless of which program you're yeah. in. Yeah. I have some friends who are in kin, and they were like, you know, I'm in kin because I want to go into med, and we were promised we didn't have to take math. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of laughed because, like, I don't know if that should have been the deciding factor in mm-hmm. your your decision for a major. Well, I mean, you know what? It is true. In Ken, you do not have to take any calculus. Yeah. Um, is that re- another reason why you went? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't know that. I didn't particularly care about that, to be yeah. honest. Although, I'm glad. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, the only math that you really have to do is is stats, um, and I think the Ken stats course is is relatively straightforward. Obviously, it's 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 stats. Right, it can be challenging if you're, if you're not super comfortable with math, but it's it's not too too bad. And then the other sort of like math course that you do is a biomechanics course. So it's basically it's kind of like high school physics, to be honest, just applied to the human body specifically. Are these both both first year courses you're talking about? Uh, those are actually both second year. Both courses. second year. Yeah. Oh, okay. So now you're specializing in multidisciplinary science. I am. Where you choose courses from the mechanical, physiological, psychological, sociological, and pedagogical branches of kinesiology, thereby designing a cross-disciplinary program of study. And upper level kinesiology courses can come from a combination of the areas including neuromechanic systems biology, 
Exercise and Health Leadership Education for Pedagogy and Physical Activity, Psychology of Movement, Sociocultural Studies. So what attracted you to your stream rather than, for example, neuromechanical and physiological sciences or social and behavioral sciences? We know it. So in Kin, there are three streams. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the one that I'm in is the, the multidisciplinary, and so that's kind of in the middle. It's, it's multidisciplinary. Yep. And then on the one side, there's the kind of more... I guess what you would call hard sciences, which would be the neuromechanical and physiological right. stream. And the other side, there are, I guess, what you would call the soft sciences, which is the sort of social psychological stream. Um, I was actually initially in my second year in the neuromechanical and physiological stream. And I switched into the multidisciplinary stream just because as I kind of took more courses and actually as my interests outside of school kind of evolved, I actually became more interested in the kind of social science aspect of kinesiology. Um, and so that's why I switched into the multidisciplinary stream, just to allow me to take a few more courses on that side of things. But the other piece with the streams in kinesiology is that they're actually extremely flexible. And ultimately, you could take a course program that could actually meet the requirements of all three of the streams really? at once. And so, like, what we've basically been told is that ultimately you can kind of switch streams all the way up until your fourth year, like, right before you graduate. It is almost in kinesiology just kind of what's written on your resume. Um, so it doesn't make a huge, huge difference. But then the other piece is that if you do just want to take the neuromechanical courses, then you'd probably want to be in the neuromechanical stream. You are still required to take maybe some of the other courses because you can't actually, like there aren't enough neuromechanical courses that you can just take neuromechanical courses. You will have to take some others. But if you do want to kind of load up that one side, then that's kind of the reason to be in that stream. The reason I'm in multidisciplinary is just to give me the most flexibility possible. Yeah. Now, I'm curious about your early first year experience in Ken. And there's sort of three main programs I wanted to talk about offered at UBC. So there's Jumpstart, which is a, a five-day orientation program that runs at the end of August. That's designed to introduce first-year students um, to the university, the faculty, and other students. There's also Imagine Day, which is the first day of the term, where the UBC community comes together to welcome new students and celebrate the new beginning of the academic year. Um, you get paired with an orientation leader and a group of students who have similar classes. I personally found this uh, really helpful um, because you kind of meet students with similar interests who may not be sure about their major, but they have some sort of career plans they're interested in. The last sort of program that's offered is Kin Camp, which I understand is program specific to your Kin degree. It is. I think yeah. it's a it's a retreat to Squamish, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So so Kin Camp is literally you go camping for a weekend with a bunch of new Kin first years, and then you have some some upper upper year leaders. Um, so of the three programs, uh, yeah. I actually only did Imagine Day. Okay. I didn't do Jumpstart. Um, Jumpstart, from what I've heard, is is really great. Like, like it, it is really, really great. Um, but what I've heard it's best for is people who are moving into residence or people who are actually new to like international. Vancouver. Yeah. So yeah, international students, people who are from other parts of Canada. Um, because it really is a way that you can just meet people. And I know a lot of people who made like their best friends at UBC just through Jumpstart. Yeah. Because you're just with the same group for a week and you end up just getting close to people and you kind of realize, you know, this person is super similar to me, maybe I should just be friends with them for, for you know, my university career, I guess. Um, so, uh, I mean, Jumpstart is a week long. So it, it is a big commitment. It's also a big financial commitment, which is why personally I didn't do it, um, because I didn't sort of see it as being worth it at the time. Uh, but looking back, I mean... I think I would still consider doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking back at it, I mean, it just seemed like a really great experience for the people who did it. Uh, Imagine Day is, I mean, from my perspective, almost mandatory for first-year <laughs> students. Like, um, It's the first like, day of class, but it, there's no classes. Exactly. So. You should go to Imagine Day, 100%. Yeah. It's not, like, you're not charged for it. There's no charge. Um, you get a free lunch, you know. <laughs> yeah. T-shirt, too, I Exactly, think. exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but no, that's, like, ultimately, Imagine Day is a really useful opportunity. You just get to meet, like, a number of people in your year. Um, it's a really great opportunity to just be social and meet people. Because one of the things about first year in university is that a lot of people, because they're new and showing up to a school where they don't really know that many people, they're very, very open and social in just the first few months of first year. Yeah. And then afterwards, 
people kind of make their friend groups and, and kind of close themselves off a little bit. So I just think that it's really, really important to be very social right at the start of university to make those friendships and make those bonds because people will become a bit less social over time. It's intimidating, uh, though. It is if intimidating. You're introverted, and, it is intimidating. Yeah. But that's why these kind of events are really, really important. Is because yeah. they are just kind of forcing you into those social situations. Like I, I personally am very introverted, and I'm also from Vancouver, so I do know a bunch of people at UBC just from living here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I actually don't think that I took full advantage of of these opportunities, and I kind of regret that. Like for I, so the third thing you talked about, kin camp. I did not go to kin camp. I very much regret not going to KinCamp. It was offered your year. It was offered my oh, okay. year, yeah. And and everybody who I've talked to who's gone to KinCamp just loved it. And it was like yeah. their, their best, the best experience in first year. It's a bonding. It's like a... Exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly. And, and um, no, I, I fully regret. Like, with, with Jumpstart, I mean, take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. But KinCamp, I think, is really, really important. Um, and... I mean, a lot of people go. I think last year maybe 150 people went. That's a lot. Um, which is like, yeah, probably like half the year. Do you know goes. how long it is? How long? There, is it a weekend? Uh, it's a weekend, it's a weekend. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's probably leave on Friday, come back on Sunday. I wish more programs at UBC would do that. Because yeah, it just yeah. kind of gets your whole, like, your journey, you know, started off with a big, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, the thing with Kin is because it's kind of so small and tight knit, like yeah. you can do that. Exactly. Whereas with something else like science, it'd be really hard. Because Especially when you're general first year. Exactly, <laughs> because nobody, like, nobody is specialized. You can't put people yeah. with the the people in their program. It would just be a kind of a mishmash. But with Kin, because it is so small, like you do, kind of know or recognize most people in your program in your year. It'd be cool though if they set up like a bunch of like different retreats for people with different interests and you could like yeah Yeah, no i mean like you know you could set up like a ski retreat or something for people who are are really into skiing snowboarding um yeah no i think that's a great idea or if you're looking to do that i mean specifically you could join the the ski and snowboard club true true they set up clubs clubs Clubs. clubs are clubs are a big thing so we didn't set out to talk about this but um in the first week i don't know if it's the first week but definitely the first month Mm -hmm. i think there's a big club day event and um, yep. that's a great place to go to meet people. Maybe you meet someone at the booth. I mean, exactly. or in the club. You just exactly. you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can always drop out. I mean, there's not a huge commitment. Exactly. But uh, maybe don't do that. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, we don't want people signing up for our clubs. Then. Yeah. Dropping out. Now, the School of Kinesiology has set up a, a peer academic coaching program mm-hmm. called KPAC. And it's designed to help students strategize, prioritize, develop approaches to learning, get involved on campus. Um, I think the approach to learning definitely changes from high school um, into university. It does. Um, What's your experience? Have you gone to their workshops or done any one-on-one with any of the... Well, you know what? I I haven't personally gone to any of their workshops, but I do actually know uh, two of the the peer academic coaches this year. Um, And they're great people super super fun to talk to and and really knowledgeable about you know study habits and and things like that they're both really smart um and the one thing that i know about uh kpac is that it is severely underutilized (laughs) not many people go that's what i've heard from these coaches um and i think that it is a really really great resource because like I think a lot of people kind of underestimate just how much you learn in the first two years of university. Uh, And I think it really is helpful just to talk to people who are in their upper years and just figure out, like, hey, maybe you could try these strategies, try these different strategies. Because I think a lot of sort of learning these different skills as you transition from high school to university is just experimentation and trying out different things. And what better way to do that than talking to somebody who's already gone through that process and tried Mm -hmm. out different things and figured out what's worked for them. So I think, you know, like what I've heard from these coaches is that they go to these sessions, they're there for like two hours, and not a single person shows up. So like kinesiology students, <laughs> like, <laughs> where, where are you guys at? at? <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, it's, and, and I just think that it's such a valuable resource and it, it kind of goes to waste because nobody, whether it's because they don't know about it or because they're scared, um, I mean... It's just it's just so valuable, and if you are a prospective kin student, you're thinking of coming in. It is, it's just it's a great resource, and it's a great resource yeah. that we have. Yeah, and you're really going to get a one on one. It sounds like if exactly. you, you, you go in, <laughs> yeah, you might, you might. What's been what was the biggest challenge first year? Would you say acclimatizing or was it adjusting to sort of the course load? 
I would say, um, in terms of academic stuff, for me, in, in kinesiology, I think that a lot of the stuff that you learn isn't necessarily super, like, conceptually difficult compared to high school. It's like the information isn't necessarily more complex or inherently more difficult to learn. There's just more. So it's just a lot more volume of what you have to learn. Uh, and I think that the first experience that people have in kinesiology, and it's really infamous, is the first year anatomy class. Um, it is just a huge information dump. And basically the thing with this anatomy class is that because... So anatomy, for anybody who's not familiar with it, is basically just learning body parts mm -hmm. at a very basic level. Um, and in kinesiology, because we're focused with movement, we learn about muscles, because muscles are what moves the body. And so basically this anatomy course is learning about all of the muscles in the body, and you basically have to memorize like all of these little tiny muscles that have these... like kind of, like, for all intents and purposes, kind of stupid functions. <laughs> it's like you have to know the muscle that, like, lifts the thumb. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe there are, like, three different muscles that are all participating in lifting my thumb. And, like, on the exam, I might be asked, you know, what are these three muscles that extend the thumb? <laughs> so it's just this, like, like, there's just this huge amount of information that gets dumped on you in this course, and you have to memorize all of it for the exam. And it was really, really tough. I think the, the, the average on the midterm, on the first midterm in that course, uh, when I took it, was 45%. So that's the average. That means that like there were a lot of people who got less than 45% on the exam. And I think it was just this kind of shock as people were coming in from high school, not really knowing what to expect, not knowing how to study. And so that, I think, is the biggest thing with kinesiology. Because a lot of kinesiology courses are very kind of information heavy. There's a lot of memorization of information. And just learning how to study that is the most important thing, in my opinion. Uh, and so that kind of goes back to what I was talking about with KPAC, about kind of learning and experimenting with what sort of study strategies work for you. Uh, that is ultimately, I would say, the most important thing, is just experimenting with different strategies and figuring out what works for you personally. Because, you know, what works for me might not work for everybody else. Um, so I think just experimenting with that and figuring things out and figuring out ways to manage the workload uh, is probably the most important thing in the transition. Is there a study technique that helped you get through, Ken? Or I think the anatomy course. So the, the anatomy <laughs> course, actually what I did, I think, was something that probably wouldn't work for a lot of people because I personally am really good at just memorizing information straight up. Um, so I basically had like maybe like 150 index cards and I basically wrote down all of the information from the course onto these index cards. And what I did is I tried to color code everything. And what color coding did for me is that it kind of helped me to like visually memorize the information. So when I was asked a question maybe about, you know, the muscles in my forearm, I could actually kind of visualize in my head what that individual index card looked like through color association exactly and so i could remember like i could i it was almost like a kind of like i don't have a photographic memory but it was almost kind of like that where i remembered what the actual index card looked like and that helped me remember the information on the card did you put like an orange bar at the top of the card or something <laughs> <laughs> i mean more or less more or less yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. what's something that okay so you used index cards are you familiar with Anki? Have you used Anki or Quizlet? Or do you prefer like writing them by hand? And uh, So that is, for the record, the only class that I've ever used the index cards for. Okay. I, I, st I stopped using that strategy because it was actually too time-consuming to make them. Um, it, I think it was important for that course specifically because it's so important just to memorize all of the information. But for other courses where there's maybe a bit less information and it's a bit more kind of based on concepts and understanding... Uh, I think that things like Anki and Quizlet are really important because you're kind of able to... So, I mean, for those who don't know, I, I, I haven't actually worked with Anki, but Quizlet is basically a thing where you can create these sort of online index cards, and what you can do is you can basically type out or ask a question on the index card, and then you kind of try to answer it in your head, and then you can click to flip it over, and it'll show you the answer. And you can also include images, too. Exactly. It's, it's, audio. it's super customizable images, yeah. audio. Uh, I'm not sure if you can draw on it, but there are probably some cue cards services where you can kind of draw on it on, on, 
on your iPad or on your computer. With uh, good like notes. That. You can use make flashcards now. So that's exactly, another yeah. option too. Yeah, so there are a lot of options for that, um, and I think that the the kind of index cards and uh, what that really does is it allows you to build up memorization based on prompts, and I think that is a really important thing. It's just learning to kind of uh, recall information based on these prompts, uh, and so if you can kind of receive a prompt in the form of a question, and then it kind of helps you recall that information. That is one method that I think works for a lot of people in studying. Uh, so I know a lot of people who use Quizlet to study, for example. Uh, I know a lot of people use Anki to study. It's it's just a, it's a really common thing, and I think it works for a lot of people. That is one strategy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, the recall is really important, especially yeah. in sciences in general. In you know my field, there's a lot more sort of math-based questions, and the goal is to get to the question sets as quick as possible. You know, and with the question sets, you know, you like you figure out sort of some gaps that maybe you're missing when you were learning it. But um, yeah, you have to apply the knowledge as quick as you can mm -hmm. and uh, build from there. So you sort of alluded to this, but how, so how did the style and the types of courses change first to second year? Um, so first and second year, uh, the evolution is kind of interesting because um, first and second year, because it's all these kind of what they're called are core courses. Uh, they're the required courses in first and second year. Um, they're all quite broad, and they're all kind of introductions to different fields of study. Uh, so you have uh, one anatomy course in first year, um, three physiology courses, two in first year, one in second year. Um, you have a biomechanics course in second year, you have a stats course in second year, you have a research methods course in second year. Uh, in first year, you have a sports psychology course, a sports sociology course. So it's kind of all over the map. And there's actually not much, I guess, kind of evolution from first to second year. It's still, it's just a different set of courses, if that makes sense. Yeah. But once you get into third and fourth year, that's where kind of based on the introductions that you've received in first and second year, you can kind of pick and choose which areas you're more interested in and what you want to sort of study further. So if you decide that you're really interested in the physiology, you can take, for example, KIN 335. Uh, and that's just a more advanced exercise physiology course based on the physiology course that you took in second year. So there is more of this kind of, uh, I guess, kind of building block tendency once you get into third and fourth year, sort of building on the courses that you took in first and second year. So I'm curious how the labs work too. Were there labs first and second year? And... There are in KIN. Um, so they aren't, uh, like for example in science, a lot of times you'll kind of register for a lab separately from the course, or maybe you'll actually get a credit for taking a lab. In KIN, you don't get credits for any of the labs. The labs are just part of the lecture courses. Um, so all of the courses in KIN are three credits, uh, which is generally what a lecture would be. Um, but then sometimes they kind of have a lab attached to it, where you go in for maybe one hour a week or maybe two hours every two weeks or so. Um, and it varies depending on the class. Some classes you have a lab which is basically just study time. Like for example, the anatomy course that I keep coming back to uh, has what's called a lab, but it is basically just time to go in and study, uh, and to study diagrams and like physical models and stuff that might help you remember stuff better. Um, whereas there is a second year exercise physiology course where the lab is actually going in and basically taking these physiological measurements. Like uh, you might go and do what's called a VO2 max test, uh, where you basically get on a bike and basically pedal as hard and as long as possible while you measure your, uh, your basically your, 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 um, your, your breathing rates and how much oxygen you're breathing in, how much CO2 you're breathing out. Uh, and then you take that and like write a lab report about it. Interesting. So it's kind of all over the map in that regard. But uh, the labs I've found are never super heavy for kinesiology. Uh, they tend to be kind of built, they, they also tend to be kind of built into the course uh, so that it kind of helps reinforce the concepts that you're learning about in lecture. Um, so the labs are more kind of what I would call scaffolding than anything. Are there some concrete skills you could list that you learned from these labs? Um, well, I mean, in so, first year, uh, there was an exercise management course that we took, uh, and the labs were basically exercise testing, so learning how to test like a one rep max, for example. Uh, so in that lab, 
there was one person in each group who basically got to go and just do like bench press and squats and deadlifts uh, and basically test their one rep max, like the, the amount of weight that they could lift one time. Um, so that is a very concrete skill that you learn in this sort of, this sort of exercise testing because that's a really important thing in, in some sort of careers that are related to kinesiology, um, like physiotherapy or occupational therapy or, I mean, there are all sorts of other things um, tied to that. Um, and in terms of the more kind of applied labs with uh, like the, the, the kind of uh, like the VO2 max testing, there's something called a Wingate test, which is where you basically test somebody's blood lactate. Um, there are all sorts of just kind of like kind of various separate skills that you learn uh, that maybe aren't like super applicable in everyday life, but are just kind of useful to know if you want to go into certain careers. Yeah. I might be off base with this, but did you learn how to like read an AK, uh, EKG? Uh, or... We did not. Okay. That's something uh, like, <laughs> so it's funny because they've come up in a lot of classes, EKGs and, and sort of talking about them and how they're used, but it's always like, oh, physicians know how to read these. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to know that. <laughs> That'd be interesting though. Maybe they it should, would be. They it should would teach be. That. Yeah. Did you ever can switch did you ever consider switching programs i have never considered switching programs i've always okay. been really happy in kinesiology what i have considered is doing a minor okay uh, so what you can do in kinesiology kinesiology actually has fairly lenient requirements when it comes to doing minors um, so a lot of people when they go to a school like ubc will end up in science or arts and the requirements for minors tend to be fairly strict. You need to take like you know a certain number of courses. You need to take these specific courses. But kinesiology actually has unique requirements for minors. So if you decide, say, that you want to do a minor in arts, which is what I'm thinking of doing, uh, I'm actually thinking of doing a minor in geography, which is a department in the Faculty of Arts. Uh, all I need to do is take 18 credits worth of courses that would otherwise be applicable if I were doing a major in geography. I see. So it's a little bit confusing, but basically that translates to you need to take six geography courses, which is not too bad when it comes to doing a minor. And they don't all have to be a one go. They can be throughout your degree. No, or... they can be, yeah. Basically all you need to do is show the school of kinesiology that you have, like, like that it's reasonable, that you actually can schedule these courses and they'll approve you for, for the minor. Uh, and then you can just take them whenever you want. So I took one in first year, one in second year. I'm taking one right now in third year. Uh, I'm still not set on doing the minor. I don't know if I'm going to do it for sure, because if I am going to do it, then I'll need to take three more. Yeah, well, you're halfway there. <laughs> I'm halfway there, exactly. Uh, the other thing to note about minors is that they can be competitive, because there's only basically a small number of minors that the school actually gives out to people. So you do want to kind of apply for them early on, uh, and then hopefully you'll get it. I actually don't know too much about the application process. I probably should, given that I'm planning on applying. Uh, but that's definitely something that you should look into if you're thinking about it. Now, when I was researching your program, I found an old link, um, an old page that is no longer active, but it mentioned a UBC Kin co-op program. Yeah. Is there still a co-op program? No, so they actually stopped doing the co-op the year that I started in UBC Kin. Uh, I'm not sure why they stopped doing it, but they have replaced it with a kind of more scaled back version. So it's called work integrated learning. Um, and it's not, it's not the same as co-op because co-op really are work placements where you go and work in a workplace for credit. Um, and obviously there is some variety there. It can, it can sort of vary how much you're working if you're working full-time, part-time, but with the work integrated learning and kinesiology, it's basically just like you're taking a course. Uh, so I know somebody who's doing uh, a work integrated learning program right now and what they're called uh, in the course list, they're called advanced seminars. So you have like an, ad an advanced seminar in sports psychology. And so it's taught by one of the, the psychology profs in UBC Kin. Uh, and they basically have lectures where they do learn about stuff, but then they also have work placements. Uh, the work placements are much less rigorous than a co-op would normally be. They only work like one to two hours a week. But the benefit of that is that you do still have time to take other courses while you're doing it. So I believe you do get 
uh, three credits for the advanced seminars, like a normal course, but you do get these work placements, and you get to learn as well as, as you're going through it. So it is basically uh, just a sort of scaled-back alternative to the co-op. Are these placements mostly on campus, or are they sort of industry-related? I am actually not sure. That's okay. I, I, I haven't looked too much into these, uh, but it is something, if you are interested in getting these work placements and you you know maybe are not getting a lot of experience outside of school, uh, it is something that you can look into, and it's, it's a great way of sort of building your resume and, and just getting kind of experience in a workplace because that's something that a lot of university university students don't have is that experience outside of the classroom and I think that that's one of the most important things you can have. Yeah. Well, we'll include those uh, details in the show note captions for the for sure. Yeah. So my last question in this section is for someone applying to university and to UBC, who would you recommend this program to and what sorts of interests does this program satisfy? Kinesiology satisfies all sorts of interests. Like I said, it's just about the study of human movement, but it can be so broad. Like, if you're interested in, let's say, transportation, like how people get around, um, that is an aspect of human movement, obviously, how people move, like, say, in a city, how people get to work. Um, that's a really important aspect of kinesiology. There aren't necessarily any courses about that per se, but it does fall kind of under that umbrella. Uh, and you'll learn a lot of really important things in kinesiology that relate to that. Uh, if you're interested in just sort of health sciences and kind of that sort of more medical side of things, kinesiology is also a really good route. There are a lot of courses that you can take that also kind of satisfy that requirement. If, and this is probably the most important thing, if you are generally interested in sports, Kinesiology is most, for the most part, where you'd want to be. Because although kinesiology isn't limited just to sports, there is still a lot of focus on sports science and how we can sort of, I guess, optimize like sport performance. Um, a really important facet of kinesiology is health promotion uh, and sort of making people in general more physically active. So if that's something that you're interested in, if that's something that you value, uh, then kin is a really good choice. Thank you for that. So the next section covers your research experience. So at the beginning of your second year, you obtained a position as a research assistant to Deputy Director Dr. Romeo Chua in his Perceptual Motor and Dynamics Lab. The lab is centered on the study of human perceptual motor control with long-term objective to understand the neurobehavioral mechanisms underlying the sensory and perceptual contributions in the preparation and execution of goal-directed actions. Your PI is motivated by his interest in the volitional and automatic control of visually guided action, the process of underlying sensory motor adaption and learning, and the mechanisms underlying motor preparation. Another objective of your lab was to investigate the principles that govern the sensory motor adaption of goal-directed actions in the face of systemic perturbations to the sensory, perceptual environment, and or the effector machinery. In second year, you're responsible for participant recruitment and data collection. You also set up participants with equipment and ran MATLAB code. Can you share with me what attracted you to this position and how you got it? Well, you know what? Um, I actually had no clue what any of that meant when I got this position. <laughs> um, what happened is that at the start of second year, I decided that I was... I had already kind of been thinking that I might potentially be interested in doing some sort of graduate degree afterwards and getting into research. And so I decided that I would just kind of shoot my shot and email a bunch of professors in kinesiology and ask if they had any openings for undergraduate volunteers in their labs. Um, so one of the professors that I emailed had been my anatomy professor in first year, uh, and he apparently recognized my name because I did really well in his course, and he basically said, sure, uh, there's a spot. Uh, and so I ended up, actually, it was a little bit confusing because I ended up working with his research partner. Um, so the, the professor that I reached out to is uh, Tim Inglis, Dr. Tim Inglis. Uh, and so he kind of works very closely with Dr. Romeo Chua, who you mentioned. Uh, and so I ended up working with Dr. Romeo Chua's master's student. Um, so it's a little bit confusing how I got there, the route. Uh, but basically, it was literally just sending emails and sending emails people asking do you have any spots do you do you need any volunteers 
Um, I think that's a really good way of doing it because I think a lot of people look for kind of paid opportunities. And postings. And postings, exactly. But just sending emails to people that you're interested in working with is is a really great way of getting into things. Uh, and even though I knew literally nothing about what they were doing, I hadn't even taken the course that Romeo Chua teaches, uh, where he talks about a lot of the stuff that's really important like they do in that lab. Like, I hadn't even taken that course. I'm taking it right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And uh, like I knew nothing about it, and yet I could still get experience. And it's I think that's a really important kind of thing that people need to remember is that, like, not everybody who's applying to these positions has all of this research experience. Like you could just get these positions where you you know if you email a bunch of people, chances are that one of them might get back to you, and and it will just kind of work out that way. Yeah. So obviously this was a, a part-time position, mm -hmm. right? Was it difficult to manage the research and your course load at that time? You know what? Uh, I would say no. Uh, because, and, and the reason for that is that because it was a volunteer position, um, the people like my supervisors that I was working for were very cognizant of the fact that like school was my first priority. Uh, and so I was sort of usually, I was usually scheduled to, to basically volunteer for two hours a week in the lab. Which is very manageable. Which is very yes. manageable, exactly. <laughs> um, because they also recognize, like, I'm not getting paid to work there. Yeah. So uh, ultimately, I didn't have a huge responsibility. Now, that could vary from, you know, lab to lab, uh, professor to professor, supervisor to supervisor. It could be that there are some people who have higher expectations. Maybe they expect you to work five to ten hours a week. Um, and there are some people who could say, look, if you, if you need a week off during exams, take the week off, by all means. Um, so there is some variety in that, and to some degree you do kind of just need to make it fit with your schedule. Um, if it's too demanding, then you might need to just take your courses and, and uh, just focus on your courses, uh, because ultimately that is probably the most important thing, is, is keeping your grades up and that sort of thing. It's, it's really tough. You don't want to sacrifice your grades to satisfy the volunteer position that you're doing, uh, even if it, it, because it is just tough to balance. But that being said, I think a lot of supervisors are very understanding, because they were students too at one point. They know what this experience is like. They know that it's really hard to get in and get this research experience, and it's really valuable for people. Um, so I think a lot of time they are very sympathetic and they can kind of help you balance those things. So just to reiterate what you said, you want to perform well in your course, um, reach out to the professor or not necessarily your professor, but maybe another professor who's working on something you're interested in and cold email them. And, you know, quite often they'll respond and they're receptive, but you got to take that first step and you don't... You want to look for um, postings and positions, but you also want to try to find positions yourself, too. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so one thing that is really valuable to look into is actually there are, there are all sorts of kind of research awards and research scholarships that you can look into. Um, and a lot of times there are sort of like some postings maybe on the website of about professors who are looking for students, but there are also times where the professors don't even know that they're going to apply until a student reaches out to them and says, hey, I'm interested in working on a project, would you be willing to supervise me? And then they kind of look at that and say, oh, that's an opportunity to apply for this award uh, and that sort of thing. So that is, again, another kind of example of a time where it is really useful just to kind of send people a cold email. Um, and that is, that is probably the most important step to take that will sort of increase your chances of getting research opportunities. Because the other piece is that if you're applying to all these postings, the postings are what everybody else is applying to. Exactly. And so it's probably more like those postings are probably a lot more competitive to get than just reaching out to a bunch of different people by email. And the other piece that I want to add about reaching out by email is that you shouldn't be intimidated if people don't respond. Because some people will respond, some people won't respond. With professors at a university, they tend to be really overwhelmed by emails. They get a lot of emails. And so a lot of times if they see something that they don't have to respond to, they just won't because it's not worth their time. Um, but I think that a lot of people feel like, like they, they, they almost take it personally. Like it's kind of like, oh, I'm not worth this person's time. But I really don't think you should take it personally. It's just that they have a lot on their plate. And sometimes it can actually be a lot of work to, to manage a kind of undergraduate volunteer. Um, so you just shouldn't feel intimidated by that. Or take it personal. Or take it personally. Yeah. Okay, so now at the end of your second year, 
he obtained a work-learn position, also as a research assistant, to Dr. Maureen Ash in her community mobility lab. Um, there, you're currently responsible for developing community asset maps, for social prescription, and in conducting a systematic review of volunteers in diabetes management. Within the systematic review, you've developed the search strategy, done screening, data analysis, and are involved in writing the manuscript. How did getting your work learn position differ from your first research experience with Dr. Chua? Well, you know what? Uh, it was fairly similar in the sense that it was just reaching out to somebody by, by email. Um, but what I was talking about uh, just now with the, uh, the awards, the research awards and the research scholarships, that was how it all started. So I initially reached out to Dr. Ash uh, because I saw that she was interested in uh, what's kind of referred to as urban mobility, um, which is a huge kind of interest of mine. Um, so I've gotten really interested in like urban development, how cities are built, and how people move around cities. So whether people take the bus, whether people drive or bike or walk, and sort of how that affects people's lives. So I saw that she had a kind of common interest, and I reached out to her and asked if she would be willing to apply to what was called uh, the Healthy Aging Summer Student Research Award. So this is actually a new award in 2023 uh, that was open. Um, so there, there are a number of different awards that you can apply to uh, depending on the field that you're in, depending on your, your field of interest. Um, one of the very common ones is the Faculty of Medicine Summer Student Research Project, or SSRP. Um, so that's a common one that, that, uh, that medicine profs uh, will apply to. Uh, the Healthy Aging one is specifically with a program called the Edwin S. H. Leong Program on Healthy Aging. Uh, and so it's basically applying. They, they just provide funding for these researchers to hire students uh, to work on research projects. And so I reached out to Dr. Ash and asked if she would be willing to apply to this award. She said yes, we developed a project. Um, she mostly had a project that she was interested in working on, and it would, it, it's the sort of thing where a lot of profs will have projects that they want to get done, and having a kind of student reach out to them is kind of an opportunity to say, oh, hey, do you want to do this project? Yeah. And then you kind of <laughs> say, oh, yeah, that would be great. Um, so the project that she uh, proposed was what you were talking about, the community asset mapping. Uh, so we applied for the Healthy Agent Award, did not get the healthy agent the, the healthy agent award, but what I did is I said, oh, are there any other opportunities? Um, you know, like, is there any other way that I could work with you? And she said, yes, you know, I'm hiring a work learn student. So work learn is a program that allows students to work part time uh, while they're taking other courses, um, and so you can work in the summer semester up to 20 hours a week. And so that's what I did: is I worked as a work learn student, uh, student, not student, <laughs> during the summer. <laughs> Uh, and I developed these community asset maps. Uh, so what specifically is that? A community so asset a, community, map? a community asset map is basically where you take all of uh, the resources in a community, and so what we would call resources are things like grocery stores or restaurants or retail stores, and you basically put them on a map of that city or town or village and present it in some way. So it's a very broad thing. Uh, but we were doing it uh, for a program called social prescribing, which is basically uh, it is a so it falls under the kind of social model of health, uh, and mostly what it's doing is uh, helping usually older adults, uh, so people usually over sixty five, uh, helping them to sort of plan their lives to 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 live like healthier lifestyles, be more physically active, and so the community asset maps were a way of helping people find the services that matter the most to them. So we mapped things like grocery stores, which would help people figure out maybe, oh, there's this grocery store that's really close to my house, I can walk to that. And so it's a way of just being more physically active. Or we also mapped things like community centers, uh, which run a lot of programs, uh, like fitness classes and that sort of thing. Uh, so we would include all of that information on the, on the, on the map. Uh, and so it was just a way of providing social prescribing workers with another, just another tool to help them sort of carry out their job. So it's a, it was a very niche thing, uh, but a really kind of useful thing.
And something you were interested in, too. Very much, yeah. Important. Because, because again, it is interested, like, it is kind of uh, very similar to my interest in urban development and how people move around the city. Well, that's great. What sort of software are you using for the, the systematic review? Are you using Covidence? Or? Yeah, so uh, Covidence is basically, it's, it's basically just a software where you can import a bunch of references or articles uh, into it. Um, and so uh, just generally the process of doing a review, of writing a review article, uh, is you search for basically anything that is related even remotely to your topic, and then you screen the articles. And so that's what Covidence is mainly used for, is screening articles. And so screening is basically where you go through and you read uh, the title of the article, the abstract of the article, and then even the entire article uh, once you get down to, once you've screened a bunch of things out. Um, and you basically read things over, and it's sort of like a human process where uh, you, you develop these search strategies where you get a bunch of things from the database, and then uh, you, as a researcher, look at something and say, yes or no, does this belong in our review? Right. And so it's basically a way of using all of this information from the, from the database, which may or may not actually be relevant to your, to your study, and basically just slowly picking things out and saying, no, this isn't relevant, no, this isn't relevant, no, this isn't relevant, until you have a kind of manageable amount of articles to write your review with. Yeah, I ask because I'm, I'm quite familiar with it right now. One of our research projects, we're looking at how AI and machine learning can be used to predict survival in HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma patients. And I'm curious, because we have a medical librarian, and she essentially, you know, she did the search with the key terms and developed, a, you know, a whole, a whole list of, you know, papers that she then imported. Did you also have a librarian, or were you involved in the search with the keywords and... No, so my, my supervisor mainly developed the search strategy um, okay. because this review actually, they started the review before I became involved with it. Uh, it was in the summer. So, so just briefly sort of how, how my work in, in the Community Mobility Lab progressed is um, during the summer, I worked on the community asset maps. And in September, I was rehired as a work learn student for the winter semesters. Uh, and since then, I've been working on the review. So my supervisor started working on the review with a different student in August, uh, and I sort of picked up where that student left on or left off, and took over and took it from there. So they had developed the search strategy already before I came on, um, but again, using those key terms, came up with a huge number of articles. I think like 2,500 articles, uh, and then we had to screen through all of those to see if they were related in any way, um, and that sort of multi-leveled screening process. Uh, to get through, yeah. During your onboarding process, did you have to get your TCP2, the, the TCPS2 core, ethical conduct uh, certificate? I actually did that okay. uh, during a research methods course. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, I, I, I think I mentioned a while ago that there's, there's a research methods course in, uh, in kinesiology, one of the required courses in second year. Uh, so I actually did that at the start of 2023. Um, for the course. Uh, it is required uh, when you're onboarded um, for any sort of UBC job, any sort of UBC research job, um, but because I already had the certificate, I had, I had done it out. already. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Are there any advantages or disadvantages worth mentioning about WorkLearn? Uh, so WorkLearn, I would say the main, it's an advantage or a disadvantage depending on where you're coming from. Um, so you basically have a set number of hours that is like a maximum that you can work in a week. During the summer, it's 20. During the winter, it's 10. And the reason for that is that WorkLearn is designed to be a program that people do while taking courses. Um, now, in the summer, I actually didn't take any other courses, uh, but I would basically work 20 hours a week on my WorkLearn, and I actually got a second job so that I could work full-time. Yeah. Um, during the winter, I am doing my work learn, doing my 10 hours a week, and also taking five courses wow. per semester. <laughs> uh, so that has probably been harder to manage. Um, so in that sense, I would say in the winter, it's very much an advantage that it's capped at 10 hours a week. Uh, in the summer, I would say it was more of a disadvantage because I actually would have liked to work full time on that project, uh, but I just wasn't allowed to. Um, the other thing with work learn, 
that I would say is a disadvantage compared to, say, some of the research awards and research scholarships, uh, is that the research awards and, and scholarships are great for your resume. And, and I don't want to, to, to say that you do all of these things just to pad your resume, but uh, ultimately that is kind of a driving factor behind a lot of people doing them, is that you know these awards look good on your resume. Uh, and so WorkLearn probably isn't quite as prestigious, uh, but it is still a really important experience, and you learn a lot from it. So You're talking specifically about funding awards, right? Yes, yeah. So yeah. There, there are awards where basically uh, the supervisor will receive a, a stipend or some sort of funding where they basically pay for part of uh, the payment that like you receive as a student, so part of your wages, basically. Um, a lot of the scholarships will basically just pay you a lump sum of money to do full-time work mm -hmm. uh, for the summer, for example. Um, the work learn position is uh, like you are UBC staff and you are paid by the hour uh, and you log your own hours. Well, I log my own hours. I know some people who do work learns where their supervisors log their hours, but you do kind of work by the hour. Um, and so, again, kind of advantage, disadvantage, depending on how you characterize it. Right. Now, in my opinion, when I was doing my research, I was looking at the KIN website, and I think it's single-handedly the best program site at UBC, mm -hmm. because there's two main things that really stood out. There was the Get Involved section, and then there was a Jobs and Volunteer section, and each had numerous opportunities to essentially get involved and get real research experience. Um, with that said, what is your advice to someone who wants to get involved but's maybe a little intimidated because they don't feel they're competitive or they don't know exactly what they want to do yet with their degree? First of all, <laughs> you are competitive. There is yeah. like there is nobody out there who's not competitive. And if you feel like you're not competitive, then you are fooling yourself. There's some sort of opportunity out there for you. You just have to find it. Uh, so that's, I would say, the main piece of advice is just don't be scared about applying for things. Um, that is one of the kind of processes that I think a lot of people don't realize that you have to go through when you're looking for jobs is just like applying to a lot of different things. Um, and it can take time to find something, but a lot of time it is really worth it to just apply for a lot of different opportunities. Uh, because if you just apply for a few and you get rejected from all of them, then you're kind of left with nothing. Um, so you want to give yourself as much opportunity as possible to find something. Uh, and like you said, the kinesiology website provides a lot of opportunities. I was surprised. <laughs> um, I, I actually, in the past when I looked there, um, there, there weren't a lot of it. Like when I looked last year when I was looking for, for uh, research opportunities, I didn't find much, but it has actually expanded over the past year. They've gotten a lot better at kind of posting stuff um, because it was a fairly new thing. Um, and so not a lot of profs were actually using it to recruit people. But now that it's a bit more well-established, it's been around for a longer time, uh, people have actually gotten used to kind of using that to, to attract people and, and just, it's, it's, it's just a more kind of equal way of, of giving everybody access to the same information and the same application processes. So that is a really valuable resource for that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't take away from the value of the cold email. And I know that we talked about it before, uh, but that is still uh, a really good way, especially if there is a particular person uh, who is researching something that you are really interested in. That is one way of just catching their attention, is, is basically just saying, look, I am really interested in your topic, and then kind of demonstrate your, your, your knowledge in some way. Because um, that's how I got my, my work learn position is I just demonstrated that I was, I was interested in urban development and uh, urban transportation. Uh, and that really actually caught the attention of Dr. Ash, who I'm working with, uh, because that's not a super common interest. Uh, so if you have these niche, interests, these, these niche interests, don't be afraid to just reach out to somebody who is studying that topic. I think you'll agree with this too, but when I look back on my first year, so first year I was in COVID, so it's tough to get involved, but I did get involved. I actually found some research, but I think getting involved early on, getting experiences early on is so key. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the sort of thing where you can leave it to until you're a senior, your third or fourth year, and you're like, okay, like I'll, I'll get involved in third, fourth year. You no, know, it's got to be like first year second year, th you got to start early. Start, mm -hmm. you know, hit the ground running. Yep. Yeah, 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 for sure. And, I mean, the one thing about doing research like that is just, uh, it's also about networking. 
Yeah. It's not just about the experience uh, that you're getting and like knowing how to code in MATLAB or something, for example. Um, it is really about just knowing people and because uh, when you know people, you will get opportunities. Uh, that's one of the most important things. And, and, and we haven't really touched on that yet. I haven't talked about that, but just the importance of networking. Um, that being said, if you don't start early, that isn't any like that isn't an excuse to not try to start later on or start now. <laughs> exactly. So the point is that just no matter how young you are, how old you are, how long you've been doing your degree, it's never too late to start. It's never too early to start. It's just a good thing to do. Now, in the next section, we're going to discuss your first authorship on the paper, Effect of Volunteers and Interventions for Middle-Aged and Older Adults Living with Non-Communicable Diseases, a Protocol for a Rapid Systematic Review. So from what I understand, you're still developing this paper, but you've presented the protocol at the Symposium Aging Better Together Research. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Can you walk me through where the opportunity to develop this study sort of presented itself I think it's with your work learn. Right? It is with my work learn. So this is this is what I talked about. This is my main project uh, through the kind of winter semesters, uh, my ten hours a week work learn. Right. Um, and so, I mean, ultimately, this is what I this is what I was talking about. Where it was kind of developed in August. There was a student who was working with Doctor Ash uh, during the summer who came up with the search strategy and and ran that and got all of the studies. And then I kind of came in and started screening these studies with, with Dr. Ash. Um, and ultimately, uh, it is just a really, it, it's just another way that we're kind of looking at social prescribing, uh, which is the same, the same topic of interest as the community asset maps, um, but we're just looking at uh, volunteers uh, and the kind of effect that they have. So, Was this paper a guarantee of the work learn though? That you would get your name on a paper? No. So work learns are ultimately very, very general. Um, there's like, I mean, honestly, I didn't really know what I was getting into when I signed up for the work learn. Yeah. Uh, and at first I really was just working on the community asset maps. Uh, and then kind of midway through uh, the summer, I think right around uh, the start of August, um, Dr. Ash offered me the work learn position moving into uh, the new year or the the, the school year. Um, and again, it was kind of like I'm just working with her and kind of helping her work on the things that that are going on in her lab, um, kind of providing uh, like almost a little bit of a guiding voice. Uh, just sort of maybe I think this is slightly more important. We can work on this uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but ultimately. Work learns are just whatever you want to do, whatever your supervisor wants to do, um, right. and it is very flexible. And there, there wasn't any guarantee; it just kind of happened. Does that make sense? So, there'd be no harm in proposing like a research project in a study that could have a paper in your work learn. No, 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 no not at all. Like, uh, I mean, my supervisor, Doctor Ash, is is super, super open to to any sort of suggestion like that. Um, this particular review paper that we're working on has kind of had multiple iterations uh, because we ran into issues with our first search strategy, so we had to develop a new one, and it's kind of taking turns. And ultimately, I have actually been able to provide a bit of that sort of that kind of guiding voice. Like I've had a very active role in shaping what the project is now. Uh, so there really is no limitation on you know, say a researcher provides you a project. You are allowed to talk to them about it. You're allowed to ask them questions about it. Uh, you're allowed to say that you think it should be changed uh, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, and and I think that that is really important. That's a really important skill to develop. Um, and so that is a really good thing about these work learns is how flexible they are. So are some of the other authors on this paper work learns as well? Are there master's students? Or? So there's one other student, uh, like one other undergraduate student, who's working with my supervisor. Um, and I believe she's working uh, as a work learn student as well. Um, and mostly the other authors on the paper are just colleagues of my supervisor who are interested in similar areas right. uh, and that sort of thing. And 
Uh, although, I mean, one thing to understand about, about these papers that are listed with a whole bunch of different authors, um, sometimes these authors do contribute like major parts of the paper, sometimes they're more kind of editors. And so what's happening with my paper is that I and my supervisor are writing the bulk of it, uh, and then we kind of send it off to be to be edited and kind of looked at, and the, the, the reasoning is kind of critiqued and all that by the other co-authors. Um, and I mean, part of the reason that we have the co-authors is because oftentimes they have more expertise in the things that we're writing about than we do. Right. Um, so for example, the, 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 the review that we're doing is focused on both kind of diabetes management and social prescribing. So we're including people who are professionals in social, prescri- in social prescribing, and we're also including people who study diabetes management. Um, and so that's kind of our way of making sure that our paper actually kind of conforms to uh, the expertise in that field and making sure that we're not kind of, uh, I guess, uh, making fools of ourselves by, by talking about diabetes and, and it's, it ends up being kind of clear that we don't really know what we're talking about. Yeah. What, what is your advice to someone who's like fixated on getting their name on a paper you know, is there something more important they should be focusing on? I don't think that having your name on the paper is like the be-all, end-all of research. Um, because it's really not. Uh, having your name on a paper is really just having your name on a paper. There's not really anything more to it. Um, I think that just being involved in research and kind of understanding what goes into it, uh, the kind of ins and outs, and just knowing people and and being able to go through that process and just kind of understanding that, understanding how to get different research positions, just how to work with people, team dynamics, and that sort of thing, are a much more important component of these research positions than just having your name on a paper. And the other thing is that it's hard to force your way into writing a paper. Mm-hmm. Um, how this happened for me was very organic. It was it was proposed to me, um, and I kind of took it on as the next step in my work learn. But it wasn't something where I came into the work learn expecting to get my name on a paper. It just kind of happened that way, and I'm very lucky for that. But um, it's not the end of the world if you don't have that. Yeah, I think to really take full advantage of your work learn, you kind of touched on this, but it's you know networking with, for example, the master students or, you know, your principal investigator. And what I mean by networking is, you know, not just adding them on LinkedIn or something like that. <laughs> like, ask about their experience, like what they went through, how they got to where they are. You know, everyone has a story like that. Exactly. And I've found, you know, personally, it's been quite illuminating talking to, you know, a lot of med students and people who have, like, very unique backgrounds that you wouldn't expect. Mm-hmm. And now they're in a same sort of setting as you. It really gives you perspective on what you might want to do with your career. Exactly. Yeah. No. I, I've talked to so so Dr. Ash uh, only has one graduate student right now uh, that she's teaching, uh, but she's a PhD student, and I've talked to her because her career path has been really interesting. She actually got a physiotherapy degree after she com- after she completed her undergrad and worked as a physiotherapist for ten years before deciding that she wanted to come back and do a graduate degree, a PhD. Um, And so that's unconventional. It is. Oh, it is definitely, (laughs) it is definitely unconventional, but it kind of made me realize that again, like what you choose to do after your undergrad doesn't necessarily define your entire career. Yeah. Uh, And you can choose to have your career evolve in different ways and that sort of thing. And I would have never come to that understanding if I hadn't just talked to her about her career and her life. So I think that you're right. That is one of the most important things that you can do. And one of the most important experiences that you can get out of research. Yeah. And you don't really know what you don't know. Like exactly. you, you, you have to talk to people to find out some things like about the opportunities and then how grad school works. Like I'm only finding out now, like I need three academic references. You know, I guess I could have found that online at any point, but I found that just through talking to someone who, you know, is in grad school. Okay. So our last section is about your advice for incoming and current kin students. We kind of touched on that with some study strategies, but could you provide some insight into the the sort of the types of assessments and exams students can expect in kin? Yeah. So it definitely depends on the course. And I've talked about how kin is really multidisciplinary uh, and there are a lot of different kind of fields of study in kinesiology. So you have anatomy, physiology, social sciences, psychology, Um, And so what you can expect does tend to differ based on those courses, but 
I think that you can expect uh, a lot of multiple choice questions in a lot of courses, um, a lot of short answer. There's not a lot of long answer or kind of essay questions that you might expect more kind of from an arts course. Uh, you don't get a lot of that in kinesiology. Um, but typically speaking, the, 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 the assessments are more of that kind of multiple choice short answer uh, and about kind of memorizing and just showing that kind of basic understanding of concept material. Are there also practical lab exams where maybe there's like a, a skeleton and you have to assign anatomy and stuff? Uh, there are. Uh, it's relatively uncommon, but there are a couple of uh, the required courses in first and second year where you have that. So the big main first year anatomy course, this big beast that I've been talking about that I've mentioned multiple times, does have a practical exam where you go in and you basically, um, you have to identify, say you're given a bone, and you have to say which bone it is. Or maybe you are given a bone and there's a little piece of, uh, of putty on it that kind of notes it's like, uh, oh, it's on this ridge on the bone, and you have to give the name of the ridge that's on the bone. Um, so that can be the sort of, I guess, the, the more kind of practical aspect that you can expect. Um, but it's not super common. There are only a few courses that do that. How did you approach seeking help and clarification early on? Were you did you go to office hours? <laughs> Obviously, I don't know about KPAC, <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, uh, KPAC. I mean, yeah, I, I should have gone to KPAC. Yeah, um, and I also believe that office hours are really valuable, and that I have again severely underutilized office hours. Um, even still, I don't really go to office hours. It's yeah. a little bit of that kind of you know practice uh, what I preach, not what I do, or. Uh, however you put that. Um, but I think that office hours are probably one of the, the most underutilized resources. Uh, a lot of professors are doing office hours on Zoom now uh, because it's just more accessible for people. They can kind of do it. Like People don't have to be on campus during office hours in order to come to them. Uh, and it's a really good opportunity. Just If you have a question, you don't have to go around and like ask your friends or that sort of thing. It can be valuable to ask your friends, but usually it's 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 a lot more valuable to just go and ask the prof. Yeah. Uh, because they know. They know. Uh, and a lot of times, I mean, one of the most important things you can do is if you have a question, or maybe you you're you're wondering something, uh, you can go ask the prof and they might just tell you that it's it's not important. You don't need to understand that for the exam. Yeah. They'll be blunt. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You might ask them a question and they'll just say, You don't need to know that. Um, which you would never get from just asking your friends. Uh, so office hours are a really good way. That being said, studying with people and with yeah. friends is a really good opportunity to, to kind of just test your understanding and, and see how you are relative to your peers. Um, and that is something, that's something that a lot of people do do. Um, I don't think that that's an underutilized strategy at all. I think that that is something that is very common and uh, kind of appropriately utilized. That's a really good strategy. I think you need to be conscious of the size of the group, though, yeah. because often, you know, you'll get distracted. You're like, oh, let's go get a coffee. It's like <laughs> two hours pass because you're having a good time. I think days like that are important, but yeah, developing a core group of friends mm -hmm. with the same values and sort of goals to study um, is extremely helpful, especially when you're learning new stuff. Um, is there any other piece of advice you'd like to offer? I would say that there are probably three really, really important things. Um, and we've kind of touched on all of them at, at some point over the course of this conversation. Actually, there's something I was thinking about just now. Um, are kin lectures recorded? Kin? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, I, I guess, a point of contention since COVID. Um, because obviously a lot of people record lectures as a way of saying, like, you know, if, if you are sick, you don't have to come to class. Um, and so a lot of my lectures have been recorded. Right now I'm taking five courses and not a single one of them is recorded. Really? Uh, so <laughs> it, there's just so much variety. It's yeah. really hard to predict as well um, because it ultimately is up to the prof. And sometimes the profs don't like to record lectures because then attendance will go down because people just watch the lectures on their own. Um, and sometimes they do record lectures. Uh, it's just, uh, it's kind of hit or miss. Um, but the one thing I would say is that if lectures are recorded, do still try to go live. I think that generally speaking, it's, it's a lot easier to learn. Um, it's a lot easier to get distracted 
if you're watching the recorded lecture, uh, in my opinion. That's at least my personal experience. Although I do know some people who find it easier to pay attention during recorded lectures because they can kind of stop and start and take it at their own pace. Uh, so there are pros and cons. Um, but yeah. sometimes you don't even have the choice. <laughs> like me right now. Um, my In my experience, you know, I completely agree. I think, especially in your senior years, when you have, you know, your course load, you have research, you're balancing volunteering, you know, Sometimes it's useful to have the recorded lecture, but at the same time, it's like, I mentioned this in another episode, it's like, I don't have time always to go to office hours, especially mm -hmm. sometimes they're at like some absurd time, like at, I don't know, 12 o'clock or something, or 3 p.m. It's like, I'm in a lab, I miss it. So I've found myself sometimes asking questions in lecture, in like huge lecture halls. I think it just might be, you know, as a senior, you just don't care anymore. It's like, I have questions, <laughs> they're going to be, and, you know, I'm going to ask them. Um, but yeah, I think going in person is so important because you know, you're focused and it's, you know, you're not going to get distracted, especially exactly. during COVID, you yeah. know, it is so easy to just go on like YouTube or, in, you know, Netflix and uh, do all that. So my last question to you is if you had to restart, would you choose to do kin in your specialization again? I would. You would. I would. I don't regret my choice at all. Uh, I think it was definitely the right choice for me. Um, that being said, I think that I am generally quite adaptable, so I think that there are a lot of things that would have been the right choice for me. But I don't regret kin, and the reason I don't regret kin is because it's something that's opened a lot of different doors for me. Uh, and it's kind of made me realize that I have interests that I, I didn't even know about before. Uh, so my interest in kind of uh, urban transportation and urban development and that sort of thing has all been because I took kin and I realized how important it is uh, for people to be more active in the ways that they move. Uh, so, for example, choosing to ride a bike rather than drive to work or to school mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing. And that's kind of because I took kin and realized how important physical activity is. And so I think ultimately... The reason that kinesiology has been so valuable to me is just because it's been more broad. And it's it's been more multidisciplinary. And it's allowed me to realize that I have other interests other than just being a physiotherapist. Since that was my interest going into kin, and I, I've kind of shifted away from it. Um, and I think that based on what I know from, from my friends in kin and other people that I know, uh, that that's true of a lot of people in kinesiology. They came in with a very kind of fixed mindset of what they were going to be doing after kin. And it's been kind of upended. And I think that that's actually almost the best thing that can happen in an undergrad. Because you're just learning about yourself. You're learning about what you're interested in. And you're not kind of shoehorning yourself into a career that you're going to end up regretting later on. I think that's a very important and shared experience by a lot of undergrads. You know, you go in, I mean, most of us in science, you go in and it's like, okay, I want to go to med school. And that's the only thing. And, you know, I was one of those students and, you know, I'm still interested in it, but, you know, definitely going through chemistry and getting exposure to these other, you know, these other opportunities, you know, it gets you thinking like, wow, like, you know, I'm interested in this and I like this and yeah, like I'm interested in medicinal chem, for example, but I would never have known about that, you know, without having gone through, you know, organic and learning about all this stuff. So Anyways, I would like to thank you for your time and the thoughtfulness of your answers, and you've provided a lot of insight today, so thank you. Of course, and thank you very much for having me.